Hey everybody, this is Brian here, and we're going to be doing part two in a list of the most underrated wrestlers of all time, men and women. We're not doing this by time or by continent. Uh, we're not doing this by gender or anything. It's open to everybody. I tried to include some diversity in this list. Um, anybody's uh, open to inclusion. Anyways, last uh, time we uh, got into the list, we carried through part four and we were talking about John Cronus of the Eliminators. Uh, you know, he died way too soon. Um, and I think he had, you know, his demons off the screen. But that doesn't change what an amazing and athletic wrestler he is. And how he, um, though he's often recognized as one of ECW's best tag teams, I think deserves mention as one of wrestling's greatest tag teams. Um, and as one of the one of the most underrated uh, tag team wrestlers in the history of of the division throughout the history of professional wrestling not just in ecw and not only did he die too soon and not get the crack at an amazing singles career or at least at being a guy like jack evans or matt seidel who um, built a career on on high dives and building a, a love with the fans kind of like a guy like jeff hardy so to speak um but Cronus, he, he definitely did, uh, I think, deserve more attention and was underrated as a tag team wrestler, you know, in the sense that he deserves the Eliminators, which includes him and Perry Saturn. Um, they both deserve to be mentioned alongside those teams I had uh, uh, named towards the end of the last video. Teams like the Hart Foundation and the Dudleys and Edge and Christian and, and so on, you know. Teams that are often brought up when you bring up, you know, I named a few factions too, like the Four Horsemen and the Fabulous Freebirds and stuff. And um, I'm basically saying that I think that he deserves to be brought up in the context of uh, being part of one of the best tag teams of all time. That not only did it never get its chance to crack the big leagues, um, isn't often mentioned in that conversation I said before of the best tag teams of all time. And he's not often mentioned as one of the best tag team wrestlers of all time in that same context as those guys, like I mentioned before. I think, therefore, Cronus is underrated and worthy of number five on this list, which is not ranked, by the way, but he's worthy of inclusion, so to speak, is more what I should say. Number six is another ECW veteran, and fear not non-ECW fans, uh, there is some other people on here. It's not just an ECW countdown, though. There, um, this guy is, I think, best known for his work in ECW, which is Jerry Lynn. I think Jerry Lynn was always overshadowed kind of by the amazing, um, the amazing athleticism of Rob Van Dam, and you know his uh, his his unorthodox karate kicks, his things like the split legged moonsault and the rolling thunder, his. He probably has the best frog splash in the history of wrestling. I mean, you could challenge me on that with Eddie Guerrero or something. But I think Rob Van Dam, also the way he sold it, like he was hitting it so hard that he actually popped off and rolled around in pain and then landed the pin. It also made for good moments where, you know, like he, he landed on the guy a second too late and the guy kicked out at two. But it, it didn't make the move look weakened or bad in the sense that it still protected the the legitimacy of the move in the sense that the guy kicked out because of that extra se that extra second it took Rob Van Dam to make it to the pin cup. You know what I mean? Um, nevertheless, though, uh, enough about Van Dam. Jerry Lynn is actually the guy who's here at number six, not Van Dam. Um, Jerry Lynn, I think, was always a little overshadowed, uh, though he had great matches with everybody he feuded with in ECW, and he was a, a darling veteran of the indies uh, a travel journeyman you know like type figure uh, um i think that jerry lynn is one of those guys who um is another guy who's often mentioned in that tier of kind of like b guys who um don't get their dues as really being one of the longest working and most consistent and uh, best in the ring performance of uh, best in the ring performers of his generation in this country you know i think that jerry lynn um my favorite stuff from him will always be the tv title type stuff you know when he was holding that belt and chasing after it 
when he was actually the champion was also pretty cool. Um, I think Jerry Lynn, though, uh, doesn't get his dues because, A, a lot of people have never heard of him. It's a, it's one of those things where he wasn't a WWE guy, so he didn't, didn't get the full exposure, um, which is part of why he's underrated. And like I said, he was often overshadowed by people who are just an inch better than him, barely. He's amazing in the ring, but he often didn't get his dues, I think, because of who he was in there with. Kind of like Marty Jannetty, we talked about earlier being paired with Shawn Michaels, which is, uh, it's it's hard to keep up with the best, you know? Um, anyways, uh, uh, yeah, I think Jerry Lynn, though, is one of those people who does deserve to be talked about in the same light as some of the people I've talked about so far in this video, who deserves to be mentioned in the breadth of best wrestler of his generation, or at least best five, you know? Let's talk about number seven, the first female entrant on this uh, countdown. Not the last, don't worry. Um, the uh, number seven entrant is Victoria. Um, I think she's probably the most underrated female wrestler of the 2000s in the sense that in a pre-women's revolution, whatever their buzzword is, WWE that is, whatever their buzzword is in terms of women's revolution, in a pre women's wrestling WWE where um, where athletes were posing in playboy year after year almost as like a requisite of their contract um, in a world where that is the landscape Victoria was a performer who went on screen um, without you know size F implants and the Pam Anderson look that WWE seemed to be so um, hepped up on and she, you know, she, not that she wasn't, a, uh, you know, not, not, I'm not saying she was like a, you know, ugly or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in a, uh, in a landscape where she looked like a normal person, uh, someone, you know, who was in wrestling shape, but was a normal person, not uh, some, you know, swimsuit model. In that kind of landscape, Victoria wrestled good matches in a pre-women's revolution WWE. And I think that though... People often remember the feud between Mickey James and Trish Stratus being one of the first ones in WWE to feature legitimate matches between the women's wrestlers um, in WWE uh, before they started actually um, featuring women in the same capacity or having them main event pay-per-views or get their own belts or anything like that. Victoria was one of the few people who didn't have that book that Vince is so obsessed with, uh, you know, that the blonde hair and the blue eyes and the, you know, that whole like Pam Anderson look. Victoria was one of the few people who was uh, uh, featured on TV, but she was always in that mid card slot in the sense that I don't think Victoria ever got uh, the credit she deserved as one of the few people in a, in a world before people like Natalia or, or Beth Phoenix, um, we're really the only people who uh, were legitimate female performers in WWE were like Trish Stratus and Mickey James. Again, I mentioned them. Um, Victoria was another one, you know, and I think that she was one of the people who held it up in the ring um, without having to have that sexist standard of, you know, you look a certain way being met, you know, without having to check that box. Um, you know, I think that uh, she definitely deserves more credit in, in unlocking that door towards um, opening up new new characters, new roles for heels and for faces for larger performers um, in the future after her. Um, not Well, it's hard to talk about this stuff. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess you would say that Victoria was one of those people who opened the door for women's performers who weren't swimsuit models and weren't hooters waitresses or something like that you know she wasn't someone who was centered around her looks she was centered around her wrestling and she could play a heel very well um i think that she performed uh some of the best wrestling of that decade of wwe before they had started performing a regular legitimate women's product on a weekly basis uh, not just, uh, you know, once per year at a pay-per-view, you know, did they crank out a obligatory, um, you know, token match. They actually, 
I think Victoria was one of the few people of that era who was putting out regular good matches on a weekly basis, but she was always, for some reason, in the mid-card, you know. Um, women's wrestling was treated as kind of a, a low title along, like, the hardcore title or something between that, like, the European title. It was, like, the second lowest-ranked belt of the company of its time, practically, which reflects poorly, again, on WWE rather than on their female performers in any way so, so uh, whatsoever. Um, I think... Number eight on this list, uh, moving uh, to the 1990s a little bit uh, towards ECW, is Stevie Richards. I love the BWL. I love the B, the big Stevie Cool thing. But I think that Stevie Richards was an underrated performer in the ring. And you, you should look at some of his stuff uh, during those uh, three-way dances. Um, he was often the first one in his matches picked off. And his... His gimmick was a parody gimmick. It wasn't totally meant to be taken seriously. But I liked the fact that he had, you know, the Stevie kick. It worked in the sense of, again, a parody and making fun of Shawn Michaels and the NWO and the Click and all those guys. Um, but it also it also worked from the sense of it kind of like the the corporate people's champion or whatever. You know, it's it's like the sense that that rock bottom there it's like you're seeing your favorite wrestler cross over to the dark side when you see uh, a wrestler hit a wcw or wwf stars uh, biggest finishing move then you see like wow he's crossed over to the dark side he sold his soul to the devil or whatever um i think stevie richards finisher of the super kick therefore worked really well as a face uh, in, in parody or as a heel in um, in kind of showing that he'd sold out to the corporate side of things, so to speak. Um, therefore, I think it was one of the more underrated finishers. Kind of like Seth Rollins would go on to use a, a move like the pedigree. Out of emulation or reference almost uh, to somebody else. Uh, anyways, let's get to number nine on here. Stevie Richards, like I said, I think he deserved more credit. Uh, he actually, I think, broke his windpipe. I think, didn't Terry Funk throw a guardrail at his neck or something crazy like that during a match? Um, sounds like something Terry would do, throw a guardrail at someone. <laughs> um, but yeah, his career was, uh, I think, derailed by the fact that WWE never took him seriously. They put him in things like right to censor and... Um, I, I think that injuries often hindered him, and if you look at the fact that he wasn't treated seriously or with respect when he got to the mainstream, uh, he wasn't given those same main event caliber matches like he was in ECW, again, where he was like one of the guys fighting for the right to fight the champion, you know, that number one contendership match. He was treated as a big, a big deal in ECW. It's like you could tell... If he hadn't gotten injured there, he would be one of those guys that they probably would have pushed kind of in the same way like Tommy Dreamer or Mikey Whipwreck were. One of those guys, those underdog guys who you saw, like, wow, he, he outgrew this whole BWO thing in a sense. And he's he's ready to become one of the company's big stars. Um, but I don't think Stevie Richards ever got the credit for the time that he was in the main event. Or the fact that he was a better wrestler than the idiotic gimmicks or lower card status he was often uh, stuck with. I think Stevie Richards deserved more time in the sun. And though uh, he, he's still around today and doing well, it doesn't seem like he's one of those guys whose personal life has uh, Im, uh, imploded a little bit. I, I think that Stevie Richards, therefore, I wish that while he was in his prime had gotten more time as... Um, as the guy, you know, as uh, as the leader of the promotion, the same way you saw when a guy like Chris Jericho or Shane Douglas was taken out of their stupid gimmicks and they were given the right to talk, uh, you see what a guy can do on the mic when they're really given the ability to cut a promo. I saw while I was watching ECW Unreleased, uh, I think it was uh, it was an unreleased promo with Stevie Richards. He was trying to play a darker, edgier, more serious character, and he had like made a mistake, and they like cut to they cut the promo in the middle, um, but the camera was still rolling for some reason. I guess they forgot to turn it off, 
and uh, Stevie Richards has really actually got some better mic skills than he was ever given the space or the time on screen to use. Um, definitely one of the most underrated and what if type wrestlers of all time, you know. One of those guys equivalent to the people in music who had two albums, but you're wondering, wow, this guy has one of the best voices I've ever heard, or it's one of the best guitarists I've ever heard, whatever. Um, one of those guys who you wonder, what if? And I think Stevie's in that box, you know, as a wrestler. Um, number nine on here is going to be our second female entrant of the list, which is going to be Someone else who I think carried wrestling through the period of time pre-WWE Women's Revolution, you know? Uh, and that's Gail Kim. She wasn't a WWE wrestler. She was in TNA, actually. She was another person similar to Victoria who was always seemingly in the mid-card. But oftentimes, I notice, oftentimes, the best matches on the show were actually Gail Kim, Gail Kim matches when it wasn't some stupid vehicle for interference or storyline uh, if they stuck her in a legitimate match with someone else who could actually wrestle and wasn't just like a, a beauty pageant winner. Gail Kim's match was often, the, technically speaking, the best on the show. And I noticed uh, watching TNA in the late 2000s that oftentimes uh, I think she deserved more credit. She was one of their main female performers. You know, looking back, I think she carried wrestling through a dark period um, where... Um, as somebody who wasn't, again, the traditional look of the Pam Anderson, like Hooters waitress, like swimsuit model, uh, basically big tits and blonde hair, sorry to be that crass, but but as a performer who was uh, someone with a smaller frame, I think she opened the way for people like, uh, you know, AJ Lee, for example, is someone who I don't think would have came without someone like Gail Kim, you know? Uh, you look at the, the fact that... Um, it opened the door for women with a more realistic size and body to actually compete without them having to have uh, enhancing surgery to be more sexy, you know. Ugh. Anyways, I uh, don't think I'm saying that with a seriousness to it. I'm just, I, it's my air quotes it. Um, anyways, yeah, I think Gail Kim, therefore, deserves more credit as one of the best American women's wrestlers of the 2000s. Um, and certainly one of the most underrated, if not one of the best. Number 10 on here is, uh, going back to ECW for a second, we're going to be talking about Too Cold Scorpio. You know, I often wonder, who are the best people that really make these DVDs? You know, I have each one of the unreleased, uh, you know, volume one, two, and three. And I've gone through all of them multiple times. I thought, you know, who's really making ECW in these unreleased matches? The ones that weren't the classic company-defining ones they put in the show intro package type thing. You know, the over-the-top rope dives or the table spots, so to speak. Stuff like that. Um, who's the guy who's really the blood, sweat, and tears of ECW, the guy who made the show on the undercard without necessarily always having to be the guy who won the title at the end. Um, and a lot of times, it was actually too cold Scorpio, especially in the early years of ECW. You know, he wasn't a real great talker at all, but he had charisma, you know, and he had a connection with the fans, you know. I would say he was similar on the mic or in terms of his charisma and presence to a guy like Booker T, maybe, you know. Um, um, I would say that, uh, Too Cold was probably kind of equivalent to, like, the Jeff Hardy of his generation. He was willing to go and do high spots that you didn't think, uh, you know, he did a great moonsault. He did, uh, this thing, which was almost like the whisper in the wind, but it was ended in a leg drop, kind of like a, a corkscrew somersault leg drop. Um, yeah, I... I think, though, that Too Cold Scorpio, uh, another classic example of a match that featured him but didn't really end with him winning was the guy, was that uh, fatal four-way or four-way dance, whatever you want to call it, um, match that he did where it was also involving, I think, Pitbull 2. Didn't it have Chris Jericho in it? Um, and, I'm, and I'm struggling to think of the, of the final guy. Was it Shane Douglas or was it 
Oh man, yeah, I'm not remembering. But but that match featured Two Cold Scorpio and and a lot of the great stuff and it was involving him, but it wasn't necessarily um that he always had to win. But I think he was one of the most underrated guys in ECW history. You know, you have your classic guys like Tommy Dreamer, Sandman, Shane Douglas, uh, Rob Van Dam, Sabu. But a, a guy like Too Cold Scorpio, I don't think is often mentioned in that classic ECW breath. In the same way, uh, a guy like maybe New Jack or the Public Enemy isn't always mentioned in the same breath as those, uh, you know, like show intro package type guys like Dreamer, Sandman, and so on that I mentioned. Um, I think that Too Cold Scorpio is one of those undercard type guys that never really got his shot beyond like the TV title and, and impressing the fans with his flying moves. I think the thing maybe that held him back a little bit was his was his real lack of ability to talk. It just seems like he had those kind of coke fuel like Robin Williams like frenetic promos. Um, I, I don't know, it really didn't impress me that much at any of his mic work whatsoever, and that wasn't really what his character was about. Still, though, I think that might be why Too Cold finds himself here on the underrated list with some other wrestlers who admittedly had classic, amazing careers, but for some reason are either not in the Hall of Fame or us, us fans maybe haven't given them their dues like they deserve. Anyways, thank you for watching, and... Um, Credit to the honorable mention guys too. They definitely deserve a shout out. Uh, just missed the, li the list by an inch. Anyways, uh, I love you guys because you're you. Thank you for watching very much. Goodbye.